So our message tonight uh, from Book of Genesis, mostly, uh, Terah's descendants. And so I thought this was kind of interesting, and we have a spiritual analogy for us. In Joshua 24, uh, I don't know if that's supposed to be, I messed that up, but I think it's 24 or 2, I think it's supposed to be. Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshiped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. Because there's a little bit of the history there, a brief synopsis. So, uh, Terah, father of Abraham, Nahor, and uh, Haran, and, uh, and that they were worshiper, idol worshippers, at least at one point in time in their life. Then in Genesis 11, verse 31, it says, Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abraham's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan, and they came to Haran and dwelt there. And so the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So this is an interesting text. We're used to, a lot of places in the Bible, it mentions Abraham hearing the call and Abraham leaving Ur of the Chaldeans, but this one says that Terah took his son Abram. So this text is the only text I was able to find in the Bible uh, indicates that Terah was the one who maybe initially heard God's call or he believed maybe Abraham received the call and Abraham told Terah and Terah believed and then still being the father he led it out and so it says Terah took his son Abram. So I thought that was kind of an interesting insight as we'll see here. The descendants of Terah, so Terah lives uh, 205 years, and so they left Ur of the Chaldees, they began on their journey towards Canaan, and for whatever reason they stop in Haran, and they're there for a time, and um, sometime during that time, Terah dies. So maybe that's why they stopped, maybe that's why they paused there, maybe he was uh, getting ill, or sick, or wasn't able to travel anymore, so they spent some time there, and that is where he dies. He never made it to Canaan. But according to this text, it was his initiative that took Abram out of Ur. Then verse 27 in Genesis 11, this is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran begat Lot. Haran died before his father Terah in his native land in Ur of the Chaldeans. Abram and Nahor took wives. And the name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcha, the daughter of Haran. So you have some color coding there, and we're going to see uh, this color coding of this uh, yellow, pinkish, and green. So Noah has three sons, Shem is one of those sons, and then down the line, something like nine or so generations from Shem comes Terah. And Terah has these three sons that are mentioned, Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. So we're going to track their lineage. And again, yellow, pink, and green. Now, Shem lives 500 years after the flood. So as I counted the genealogies uh, in the book of Genesis, Shem lives longer than Terah, Shem lives almost as long, if not longer, than Abraham. And so Shem lives long enough for Jacob, or rather Isaac, Isaac to know Shem. Now Shem's never mentioned again, so I don't know where he was living or what he was doing, but he very easily could have come in contact with Terah, very easily could have come in contact with Abraham, and again, very easily come in contact with Isaac. Although Isaac was then in Canaan, and Shem didn't go there, but, but he could have come in contact with Abraham and Terah. So Terah, again, is, uh, I have it yellow, 
pink and green, and then the three sons. And so then Terah has another child named Sarai, later named Sarah, and Sarah marries Abraham. So both 100% Terah, whoever Terah's wife was, she's never mentioned. Then Haran has a daughter named Milcha, and Milcha marries Nahor. So Nahor marries his niece, Abraham marries his half-sister. So still, everybody up there is 100% Terah, or from Terah. Abraham, with uh, an Egyptian slave, uh, a servant, Hagar, has Ishmael, and from Abraham and Sarah, we have Isaac. And so Isaac is still 100% Terah. Both his parents are 100% Terra, so you got a lot of intermingling of the bloodline there with them too. Nahor and Milka have Rebecca and Laban. Now, there might be one generation between that, but, uh, but basically from them. And so Rebecca is this pinkish purple and green because she has some of Haran through Haran's daughter. And the same with Laban, he's got some Nahor in him and some Aran in him from Milka. Everyone tracking that? Everyone get that? All right, so you get this combination now. So still now, everybody on that board is still directly from uh, Terah, except Ishmael. I guess Ishmael has the, the, the wife, the mother that's uh, the Egyptian. But all the rest are still directly from Terah on both sides. And so, uh, and then Haran has his son Lot and his daughters get him drunk and rape him. So his daughters and Lot are together. And again, all of them are directly from Haran and directly from Terah. So Ishmael has a daughter, Melah, and Isaac and Rebekah have a son, Esau, and Esau marries Ishmael's daughter. So he's marrying what? That'd be a cousin, right? This is where you get the kissing cousins taking place. Right? Again, so now more, some more intermingling of the Terah bloodline uh, directly in the family. And so now with Esau, Esau is a combination of all three of the sons of Terah, because he has, from Isaac, he has some of Abraham and Sarah's uh, bloodline. From Rebekah, and thus through Nahor, he has some purple in him, right? So he has some Nahor blood. And through Esau's grandmother, Milcha, his great-grandfather, Haran, he's got Haran's blood in him. So Esau is a combination of all three. And then again, he marries a granddaughter of Abraham. Jacob is born from Isaac and Rebekah. And so Jacob now is, again, almost 100% Terah. He's got, uh, from Isaac's side, Abraham, Sarah through Terah, through Rebekah, the combination of Nahor and Milcha from Haran. Laban has two daughters, Leah and Rebekah who are also, I'm sorry, Leah and Rachel, uh, who are also directly from Nahor and Milcah, and Milcah's from Haran. <laughs> so they've got uh, basically 100% blood from, from the two brothers, and they marry Jacob. So again, cousins, kissing cousins again. Lot uh, from uh, his daughter's uh, raping him, committing incest with him, produce Moab and Ammon. And again, so just a lot of Haran genes in that setting. A lot of Terra in them. From Malach and Esau come the Edomites, and thus the Edomites are again a combination because of 
Esau coming from Rebekah, and Rebekah coming from Nahor, and Milcha and Nasaran, and Esau coming from Isaac, and Abraham and Sarah. The Edomites have a combination in their genes from all three of the sons of Terah. Jacob, through Leah and uh, Rachel, have, I think, eight of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so eight of the 12 tribes of Israel have this combination of blood from Abraham, Sarah, Nahor, and Haran, the four children of Terah. The Moabites come from Moab, and the Ammonites come from Ammon. And they're still just fully green at that point. But then, through the Israelites, Boaz comes along, and several generations later, and Boaz marries Ruth, who is a Moabite. And so now we're going to start mingling the, uh, the seed of the of Haran even more so, they already come in through Milcha a bit, and so Boaz and Ruth, they produce Jesse, and thus Jesse is a combination from the bloodline of all of the, of the three sons of Terah, really four children of Terah, counting Sarah, right? And then through Jesse, a couple generations later, comes David, right? And so David, David is a mixture of Abraham, Sarah, Nahor, and Haran, all from Terah. And then from David down the line, we have Yeshua. So Yeshua has a combination in him, or had a combination in him when he was here on this earth, from the three, the four children of Terah, from Abraham, Sarah, from Nahor, and from Haran. I don't know what all that means, <laughs> per se, and I don't believe in salvation through bloodline in any way, shape, or form. But other than that, uh, Yeshua can relate to all of us. Right? So he has in his history, he's got uh, incestuous relationship taking place uh, from the Moabites, um, who again were born because of a rape situation, an incest rape situation. He's got uh, cousins coming together. He's got combinations such as Leah and Rachel with the deceit going on there of who would marry uh, Jacob. Jacob ending up with both of them and then the battle's taking place there. And so no doubt a lot of the children born with a lot of turmoil in them as they're in the mother's womb and these Women are fighting for Jacob's loyalty. And so all of that comes down into uh, Yeshua. He funnels down all into him. And so thus, he can relate to all of us. He was tempted in all ways as we are. He did not come here directly out of God's hand. He came here through Miriam, through Mary, through this whole lineage from Terah, through Abraham, Sarah, Nahor, and Haran. Generation, curse 4,000 years of humanity, curse he came with our weaknesses, with our tendencies, so that he can understand us, so that he can relate to us, that he can succor us in our times of need. He knew what it was like to be tempted from within. He knew what it was like to be rejected. He knew what it was like to go through life on this difficult earth, in difficult times, and thus he can relate to all of us as he took on not only flesh, took on a flesh with all of its dysfunctions and all of its tendencies, but without sin, because he also had the divinity in him. And maybe this is what I really should have added to this sermon message tonight. As people wonder, how was it? And I have some slides, I didn't put them in for tonight. I'll put them in for tomorrow night. <laughs> how was Yeshua able to not sin as a teenager? 
How was he able to sin, not sin, even as a teenager, even as a youth? How was he able to do that? So some religions teach, you know, he just came in his divinity and he had a halo over his head all the time and that his mother was immaculate and that's why he never sinned. But that doesn't match up with biblical history. It doesn't match up with the Bible text that tell us that he took on human flesh that he took on the seed of Abraham, that he took on the root of Jesse, that he came through the line for us, that he was tempted in all ways. And again, if he's... If he, yeah, well, he always knew his purpose, but as a young child, as a young teenager, how was he able to not sin? Or why did he spend a lot of time praying? Why would he have an interest in praying if he was just like us. Again, as a teenager, you know, the typical teenager, even if they're raised in a godly family, have times where they're not interested in praying, they're not interested in spiritual things anymore. That was the parents' thing, and now they want to go find out on their own what life is about and what else is out there. He went about his father's business, but why? Why? Why are, if he was born as we are, He was with God always from the creation of the world. Yes, yes, he was with him, went from the creation of the world. But he came here in human flesh. He took on our humanity. Yeah, it doesn't say that he came as the seed of Abraham before Adam before the fall. He took on Abraham's seed. He came from Abraham. And Abraham, again, was years into the degeneracy of humanity. And David's seed and Mary's seed, and down through us. This is the key. And this is how we can overcome as well. Because he overcome, he lived his whole life without sin. When he was born, who was his mother? Mary. And what type of person was she? Carnal. She was human, right? She was carnal. She wasn't immaculate. Contrary to Paul's teaching, she was carnal. Who was his father? God. So he had this combination in him. Now, when you were born, what type of person was your mother? Carnal. What type of person was your father? Carnal. Correct. So we have that carnal nature from us, and that's why we have the tendency to sin. He had that tendency also through Mary. Now, when we're born again, who's our father? God. And so from the point of our birth, new birth, from that point on, we have the same power available to us that he had to him even as a child. So he had the combination, and we have the combination. We still have our carnal nature from our parents tugging at us, but we now have the Holy Spirit. We now also are partakers of the divine nature and thus can overcome all sin as he did. And that's the key, and that's the difference. And thus we can overcome as he overcame. And that's what the Bible tells us to do. Now here at the bottom of this list here, we have the Edomites, the Israelites, the Moabites, and the Ammonites. Again, all from Terah. The Bible mentions all four of them again. We looked at that last week. Daniel chapter 11, verse 41. But these shall escape Escape the beast's power, escape the mark of the beast, escape the king of the north, who's the beast, just a different name for a different chapter. They shall escape from his hand, from his, the king of the north, the anti-Messiah's hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. And who were they? Children of Terah. And biblically, historically rather, they were on the outskirts of Israel. They were the three kingdoms there in the colors. 
to the east of Israel. And under King David's rule, they were included as part of Israel. And under King Solomon's rule, they were included as part of Israel. And so we have the very end of Daniel chapter 11 and the very beginning of Daniel chapter 12, your people, Daniel's people, the Jewish people, shall be delivered. The word that's translated delivered there is the same Hebrew word that's in chapter 11, translated as escape. So why they translated one time escape, one time delivered, I don't know. It could be escape both ways, delivered both ways, interchangeable words. So in other words, again, we have all four families. Edom, Moab, Ammon, and the Israelites, all being delivered from the beast's power. And again, not all of them, but in a prophetic way, that there will be people. Here's another text from Amos chapter 9, verse 11. I will raise up the tabernacle of David, Israelites, that they may possess the remnant of Edom, Edomites, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord. So we have the tabernacle of David, believing Jews. We have the remnant of Edom, converted Muslims, Gentiles called by my name, commandment-keeping Christians. Have, keep the commandments and have the faith of Yeshua, as it says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, in Revelation for chapter 14, verse 12, the remnant. God brings it all together. And so basically you have the olive tree there. You have Jewish branches and non-Jewish branches all connected into Yeshua, the vine, Yeshua, the root, into him as the tree, and thus being saved. So again, it's not through bloodline. We have texts like Romans chapter 10, verse 12. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's available to everyone, to the Edomites, to the Moabites. The Moabites, Israel wasn't supposed to interact with the Moabites. The Bible commands not to. But then Boaz goes and marries Ruth. Why? How could he do that? Ruth was no longer a Moabite, right? By flesh, she's yes, still a Moabite, by heritage, by race, but she is an Israelite by faith child of God by faith. And thus, they can marry together and produce Jesse, again produces David, again produces the Messiah. It says no distinction. It doesn't say that it's the same Lord who's rich to all who are children of Terah, who have a little bit of Terah bloodline in them. It doesn't say whoever has a little bit of Terah's bloodline in them shall be saved. No, it says whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now there is just the fact that parents who train their children to know the Lord have a much better chance of their children staying with the Lord. And so there is a, to the third and fourth generation of them that curse him, and to the thousandth generation of those who love me. Right? It's in the Ten Commandments. And so there is this passing down, and then there's the power of prayer. Right? So if Tara believed in the Lord after being an idol worshiper for a while and then gave his heart to the Lord and heard the Lord's call with Abraham and led the family out of Ur the Chaldeans, came out of Babylon to seek the Lord, to follow him, and pass that down to his children and prayed for them. And then Abraham, a believer, and Lot, a believer, praying for their descendants, then God would have reason and power over the devil to work in their behalf and to bring them to the Lord. But again, the gospel is still open to all. And that's what God has called us for. People get all bent out of shape, you know, right now with the war going on. You know, there's chosen people. Oh, they think they're so special, they're chosen. Well, the Bible says that Israel was chosen, but chosen for what? Right? You don't just get chosen in anything, right? Someone doesn't hire someone or choose someone for the job. 
just so that they can stand there and be a mannequin, right? A, a sports team doesn't choose someone you know, just to sit on the bench and, and look pretty. They choose them for a reason. They choose them to fulfill a role. They choose them to do a job. Right? Sports team chooses them to go and play this position, right? They were chosen for a purpose to do something. And so God didn't choose the people just because he thought they were better. The Bible tells us not, because they were not better. Not greater, not in any way, shape, or form. But chosen to choose others. Chosen to tell others. With a responsibility, here's my commandments, here's my word, here's my Torah, here's my scriptures. Go and tell the world. And tag the world. That works. So kind of like the type of tag where you go, now they become part of the team. No longer a Moabite, now a child of God. No longer a Jerichoite prostitute, Canaanite, now part of the team. So we're chosen to choose others. And then once you get tagged, your job, now you're chosen as well. You're called as well. And you're called now to go tag others and invite others to join the team as well. That's God's calling upon us. And thus, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's the gift that God gives to each one of us. He calls each one of us to be saved by Yeshua already paying his blood for us already sacrificing himself for us, already laying down his life, already carrying the weight of our sins upon him long before we were born. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. Bore the curse, our curse, he bore our sins, bore our punishment, took our place, took us into himself, and killed us, crucified us in him, and then grants us the Holy Spirit to go forth, and to live holy lives by his power, by his grace, and then to share that with others so that they also can be liberated, that they also can be set free from the carnal nature that they've inherited from their parents, from Adam and Eve, that they also can be partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. To set us free. And that is our calling. That is for each one of us. No matter who your parents are, doesn't matter. What now matters is you are a child of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has given to all of us, that we should be called sons and daughters of God. And so as we pray, if you've not yet received your calling, if you have not yet received God's gift of salvation, he's already paid it for you, I invite you the moment we pray, to accept it. To accept the forgiveness removed and gone, and to accept his power, change you, transform you, give you hope, give you faith, give you joy, give you peace, give you victory over habits, difficulties, worries, fears, anxieties, bitterness, wrath, anger, set you free so you can live in him and walk in him and experience eternal life. Secondly, if you have received that calling and you're just holding on to it yourself, keeping it to yourself and not sharing it with others, I invite you to receive the power of the Holy Spirit to go forth by his power and share it with others. Third, if you have received and believe in Yeshua, but have not gained the victory over sin. There's some area, some ongoing 
known, cherished, rebellious sin still in your life, then a moment when we pray, I invite you to surrender it. There is a difference between known sin and unknown sin. And so even as a child, she was kept from known sin. And it doesn't mean he didn't poop his diaper, he didn't cry through the night to wake his parents up. Right, but he, no known sin because of the power of choice and the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's available to us. And so if you're not taking hold of that power, that victory over whatever sin is in your life, known, cherished, ongoing, continual rebellious disobedience to God's word, in a moment when we pray, surrender that to the Lord. Receive his forgiveness, receive his cleansing, and receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit so that you, like Yeshua, can overcome in all things and be an overcomer with God. And that's the definition of Israel. The word Israel means overcomer with God. So if any of those areas apply to you, let us pray and let God do his work. Our Lord, our God, King of kings, Lord of lords, God of mercies, thank you for working through Terah and Abraham and Sarah and through Lot, and thank you for your work in these people's lives, bringing forth Yeshua. Thank you, Yeshua, for coming through this earth and knowing what it's like to live here, knowing what it's like to have the baggage of inherited and cultivated tendencies to evil, knowing what it's like to be pulled from within, Thank you, Lord, for also knowing what it's like to have victory. And so give us the power of choice and give us your mind, give us your heart, give us your spirit, and give us victory over sin as well. Change us and transform us and then use us in choosing others for your kingdom. In Yeshua's holy name, amen.